give you your own line test. So the reason I like doing this is that you get a sense of how they word their questions from some of the, the ways they do it and kind of what they focus on. Now there's a couple of things that I want to, uh, some hints to make it worth your time for coming here this morning. First one, there's going to be in type 2 and type 3 tests, there's going to be questions that require you to know is the refrigerant a high pressure refrigerant or a low pressure refrigerant. The hint is this, from what I've seen and observed for the test for ESCO, that if it's a high pressure refrigerant, it's an even number refrigerant. For example, the last number is 2, R22 is a high pressure refrigerant. If the last number is odd, then it's a low pressure temperature. An example would be R123. When they're going to talk about the flammability and toxicity chart, so far in the test paper questions that I've seen from ESCO, the only one that's not an A1 refrigerant, that's a B1 refrigerant, is R123. Some other things. What I like, we like, what I'd ask you to do is when you go up there and you take the exam, I think Mr. P, Larry's going to be proctoring it, is that you bring with you uh, two blank sheets of paper. And while it's still fresh in your mind when he tells you to begin, that you actually begin with your blank piece of paper and you do two things. One is you draw the refrigeration cycle and you label compressor, condenser, metering device, evaporator and that you also write down the state of the refrigerant, a liquid, a vapor, high pressure, low pressure, just as a reminder so that you have this. Come on in. Grab two of those handouts right there if you would, sir. So that you, that you do that, okay? Uh, that would be important because the core questions, there's going to be probably six or seven that have to do with what's the state of the refrigerant? entering the metering device? What's the state of the refrigerant leaving the compressor? What's the state of the refrigerant entering the uh, compressor? That kind of stuff. So this way, instead of, and this is things that you've talked about and covered, but it's helpful to have it right in front of you when you answer the question. The other purpose for your piece of paper, I want you to write down the recovery efficiency chart which is part of your handout, and I'll point out to you in your handout where to find that. I need you to commit that chart to memory. And, and I'll make sure that before you leave here today that I'll, that'll be one of the things that's on the screen that you can see. Uh, and we can go over, because it is that important. So, you know you're taking this EPA exam, it's section 608 of the Federal Clean Air Act. It is the exam for stationary equipment. It does not include motor vehicles. Motor vehicles are covered under what's called Section 609. There are four categories for technical certification. They're going to be Type 1, they're going to be Type 2, Type 3. So what's going to happen is, is that you're going to take all of them. You're going to take four tests. And of these four tests, there's going to be 25 test questions each. You have to pass each section. So you can get no more than seven wrong in any one section. The other thing is, is that it's core one, two, three. You have to also pass, you must pass the core for certification. So if you pass core and you only pass type one, then before you leave that morning, when you hit the enter button, the computer will print out for you, okay, you're now a type 1 certified uh, refrigerant handling certificate. So you walk away with something. The other thing is that you can come back and you can retake just the part of the exam that you didn't pass. So if you didn't pass type 2 or type 3, when you come back, you don't have to retake core and 1, you just take type 2 and type 3. So you're going to, with a little bit of effort uh, this week, take the exam on Saturday and get your universal certification. And if you don't, then 
pretty whatever the way to schedule it, uh, you'll come back and you'll definitely get your universal uh, certification. So the, the odds are on your side with just a little bit of effort. Type 1 refers to people who maintain, repair, and service small things, refrigerators, deli boxes, uh, window air conditioners, package, small package units, systems that hold five pounds or less of refrigerant. Type 2 refers to technicians, and this is the focus of type 2, has to do with high pressure refrigerants. And in Long Island, those applications are mostly air conditioning, split air conditioners, heat pumps. Those fall into the category of type 2. High pressure, usually air conditioning. Type 3 is the opposite of the high pressure, it's the low pressure. It's low pressure refrigeration. So low pressure that you're going to see, and you, you did this when you talked about chillers, is that it has to do with, um, with mechanical compression air con uh, comfort systems that are using a chiller system. And R123 will be the kind of refrigerant they talk about there. So it's low pressure systems. When you pass all of these things, core, one, two, three, then you have universal certification, which means by law you can handle the refrigerants that are found in either a small appliance, in a high pressure appliance, or a low pressure appliance. Now you did not take, there's not one question on electric in this exam. This exam is about do, do you, Dan, do you, Marco, do you guys know how to use your gauges, how to use a recovering machine, and by law, how much refrigerant you must pull from those machines? And can you do this in, in a way that it's not going to release it to the atmosphere? This is what the intention of the exam is. So that's what they're focused. So there's no technical questions regarding electric, troubleshooting questions, any of that kind of stuff. It's going to be questions related to using your gauges, recovering refrigerant, transporting refrigerant, re and charging refrigerant in a way that's not going to release it. So the very first thing that they're going to cover is they're going to say, what is refrigeration? Uh, and they're going to go over some basic core science. What is refrigeration? This is the classic definition that you've heard from time to time in the courses here. It's a first, uh, heat is a form of energy. Refrigeration is the movement of that heat energy from where it is not wanted to an area where it's less objectionable. And they use an example of a refrigerator in that a refrigerator removes the heat from inside the box and transfers it to the outside. So that's sort of the classic definition. This is their refrigeration cycle. Remember, this is what I'm asking you to draw um, with that blank piece of paper when the proctor says it's okay to do this as your, as your means of remembering uh, the cycle. What I want you to pay attention to here is this. They put the metering device on the bottom. They put the compressor on the top. Here's the evaporator, here's the condenser. Most of the time that you've been around here, the instructor draws is actually the, with the compressor on the bottom and the metering device on the top. I don't want that to throw you off. So what I want you to do is to practice drawing it like this because this orientation gives me an indication of how they're going to ask their questions as well. So keep that in mind. We're going to have to draw that. What I'm suggesting to you is you bring two pieces of paper. When you sit down for the test, when the instructor says begin, the first thing you do for your own purposes is to draw this cycle out. So that because they're going to ask you seven or eight questions. What's the state of the refrigerant leaving the metering device? What is it entering the condenser? This way, if you write it out and it's there, now you have something to reinforce, maybe reassure you of what the right answer is. They are going to ask you questions about your gauges. 
They're not going to ask about your sort of fancy gauge that you have with the evacuation and the charging hose. They're going to ask you about the classic one right here. They're going to do, it's going to be very simple questions. They're going to say, what is a manifold gauge set? The low pressure gauge is typically what color? Blue. The high pressure gauge is typically what color? Red. The hose for the low pressure gauge is usually what color? Blue. The hose for the high pressure is usually red. Uh, they're going to also ex explain that or ask you the, what is the definition of the compound gauge? Why is the blue gauge called a compound gauge? And the answer is, is because the compound, the low pressure gauge, can read both high pressure and pressure, uh, I'm sorry, can read both pressure, positive pressure, and pressure in a vacuum. If it's reading pressure, it's reading pounds per square inch. If it's reading vacuum, it's reading inches of mercury. Those are going to be the kind of questions. The yellow hose is the hose that's used for recovery, charging, um, for dehydration with the vacuum pump in this case. Another, and if you have a gauge set that's like this, the, uh, the definition of the yellow hose, the name of it, is the utility hose. Now, what we are going to do in, in this presentation is you're going to see they're going to spend a lot of time talking about pressure and vacuum. There's going to be a lot that they're going to cover in ESCO. What, whatever, if they're spending time covering it, it means that you can definitely expect it to be a test question going forward. So keep that in mind. If they put up here and they emphasize it, then it's going to be things you're going to definitely see on their test. So pressure is defined as the force per square inch, PSI. We're going to talk about PSI, G, PSI A, millimeters of vacuum, inches of vacuum. So we're going to be covering a number of things. So as a reminder, as a refresher, atmospheric pressure at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch. What that really means is that from where we're standing to going way up 50 miles up in the air, that there is, that the weight of that air is 14.7 pounds when it hits us down here. If we go up higher, if we go to Denver, Colorado, it's going to be less pressure. And if we travel to Israel, to the Dead Sea, it's going to be more pressure because they're about 12 to 1,500 feet below sea level at the Dead Sea. Why the sea is dead. Now, common measure for atmospheric pressure, having nothing to do with refrigeration now, but just going back um, more than 100 years, how did they measure this? They used a column of mercury as illustrated right here. So a column of mercury at 14.7 pounds per square inch will rise in a tube 29.92 inches high. So when we say a column of mercury at atmospheric pressure, and we say PSI, G at atmospheric pressure, we're really talking PSI at atmospheric pressure, we're saying the same number. We're saying the same thing using two sets of numbers. 14.7 pounds is pressure at sea level. Another way of saying that is that it's inches of mercury, 29.92 inches on the positive side. On the positive side. So they're equivalents. They mean the same. All right, so we have PSI, we have inches of mercury. Now we're going to talk about what is exactly gauge pressure. Sometimes you see it shown as PSIG. So the pressure reading we most often use is called gauge pressure. And atmospheric pressure is shown as zero PSIG, or pounds per square inch gauge. What we're saying is this. If you take a look at your compound, if you take a look at your manifold gauges, and you look at where the needle is right now, you'll see that they're going to be at zero. The fact of the matter is, your gauges really are not at zero. 
the gauges are really, when it's at zero, means it's 14.7. And this is going to be important when we talk about low pressure refrigeration because it's, that's the only way the numbers make sense to you as you go through the material I gave you the study guide when they say the rupture disc will explode at 15 pounds per square inch. And, I, and I'll show you what I mean as we go. So now, here is compound gauge. Notice there's a slide. They're taking the time. There's going to be a question on the compound gauge. Compound gauge are used to measure both low side pressure and above and below atmospheric pressure. And here they're saying, and this may even be a test question, that if you were to take your compound gauges stand and you got a job in Denver, Colorado, and they're telling you you should go and adjust the, uh, the, the scale to take in consideration the lesser pressure. Or Marco, if you go to Israel, where I'm sure there must be a lot of air conditioning work, you're in there, I have a, a house on the Dead Sea, you got to adjust your scale so that it reads the proper pressure. So if we talk about pressure, now let's talk about just like what is, what is uh, the feeling of uh, cool is the absence of heat. What is the absence of pressure is a vacuum. So pressures below atmospheric are usually read in inches of mercury, capital H, small g. Or they may be read in millimeters of mercury. And it's shown as little m, capital H, little g. A thorough understanding of vacuum principles is an absolute necessity for the AC tech, since an increase in pressure will increase the boiling point of a liquid. The opposite is also true. The lower the pressure, the lower the boiling point. Any pressure below atmospheric, any pressure below atmospheric pressure, remember that's 29.92, or 14.7 is now considered a partial vacuum. A perfect vacuum would be the removal of all atmospheric pressure and for reading a deep vacuum a micron gauge is used and a micron equals one one thousandths of a millimeter. So it's a lot of under stuff there. What should be a little concerning to you is this word thorough understanding the vacuum principle. So you know they're really going to emphasize this. And that's okay because you got a couple of days to cram and to get prepared for this. Absolute pressure. The absolute pressure scales allows measurement of both vacuum and pressure to be made using the same units without doing any conversion. You don't have to add 14.7. Absolute pressure measurements are indicated as PSIA, pounds per square inch, absolute. Zero PSIA is pressure that cannot be further reduced. Since atmospheric pressure will measure 14.7 PSIA at sea level, gauge pressure can be converted to absolute pressure by adding 14.7 to the gauge reading. Now they're going to talk about, and we're going to come back to there's going to be a very good chart that's in your handout that kind of clarifies this whole business of vacuum and inches of mercury and pressure. Um, stratospheric ozone, why are we here? Why do we have to take this test? So what they did is they discovered that something was destroying the ozone that's found in the stratosphere. This ozone protects us from the sun's rays, particularly the sun's ultraviolet radiation rays. This ozone that protects us has a um, has a uh, an atomic um, uh, configuration, which is it is made up of three three atoms of oxygen, forming one molecule of ozone. So when this ozone is broken down, it goes from being O3, it becomes O2, and its name changes to, uh, you'll see it up here, uh, something meloxide. 
So, ozone protects us from harmful UV radiation. Um, test question here is, they're going to ask, stratosphere ozone depletion is a global problem. They're going to a test question, if you get this particular bank, to say, is it a local problem? Is it a state problem? Is it a national problem? Is it a global problem? The answer is it's a global problem. What happens, uh, the test question you may get is going to be E, all the above, but what happens with the, the depletion of the ozone when we lose this protection, that it, it increases crop loss, increase in eye diseases, skin cancer, reduction in marine life, the roof, dead trees, deforestation, increased ground level ozone, which is small. So, the depletion of the stratospheric ozone it leads to nothing good. What causes this stuff? What causes the harm? What causes the depletion of the ozone? Depletion is an important word because there's going to be a number they're going to assign. It's going to be called ODP, ozone depletion potential. The ozone, what affects the ozone is that refrigerants, that are made up of the compounds CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, HCFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, all contain in their first letter, or second letter, or the second one, is the word chlorine. They all contain chlorine. The most, the one with the most concentration of chlorine, of chlorine is the first CFC. Uh, it's just like reading the label on a uh, food um, package. Whatever's in the package the most is what's listed first. In this case, the first C in CFC stands for chlorine. It's chlorofluorocarbene, chlorine, fluorocarbene. The next one, and that one would be refrigerant R12, the most offending one to the environment. The next is R22. And it stands for hydrogen, and then chlorine, and then fluorine, and then carbon. So uh, those are your two big ticket ones. They're also what's going to be called the class one and class two regulated refrigerants, if you see that word bantied about. The class one refrigerant is the CFCs. The class two refrigerant is HCFCs. So, when these guys get released into the atmosphere, they deplete the ozone layer. So the chlorine in these compounds is the culprit. When the chlorine atom meets with an ozone molecule, it takes one oxygen atom from that ozone molecule. This forms a compound called chlorine monoxide, CIO, and leaves it as an O2 molecule. It also is a chain effect because it starts a chain of events that continues, which you will see in the next slide, I believe. Yeah, so chlorine is the problem. And not just chlorine that may be found in other ways, but chlorine that's been manufactured, R12, R22. If you recall, at some point when you took, you had Unit 9, and they talked about the, the qualities, what makes a good refrigerant, all the things that makes a good refrigerant, uh, let's see, that it can, it, it works well with the oil and the compressor, it's not toxic, it's not flammable, it won't break down the windings in the, in the motor. All the things that make a really, really good refrigerant is also all the things that makes the chlorine stay so long in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere. So we manufactured sort of a monster to the, to the stratosphere. R12 was the best refrigerant that you could ask for and, and normal applications we get involved with. And it's also the most offending to the ozone layer. So these chlorine, mon what we start this cycle, the chlorine monoxide collides with another ozone molecule, it releases its one of its oxygen atoms and it becomes O2 and it continues and continues. Uh, what they have here is they say a single chlorine atom 
single chlorine atom, keyword being atom, can destroy 100,000 molecules of ozone. So test question in the test bank, they don't ask you it exactly like this. They're going to say, how many chlorine atoms does it take to destroy a million ozone molecules? And the answer is 10. The answer is 10. If they throw that one at you, that's one you got in your back pocket. Uh, this is the thing, some people dispute that it's the CFCs and HCFCs in the refrigerant that causes this problem. This problem is really caused more by uh, natural uh, conditions where chlorine appears. EPA disputes that. They say they have evidence and proof. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, test question right here. The chlorine and CFCs versus the, that chlorine that does appear naturally as a volcano, when a volcano erupts, natural chlorines released into the atmosphere, into the stratosphere. If it's a manufactured chlorine coming from a CFC refrigerant or an HCFC refrigerant, it will not wash out with water. It's not water soluble is the word that it's used. So you can't wash a chlorine chemical that's been manufactured out. You can with the stuff that comes spewing out on the earth at a volcano and stuff like that. Now, ODP is the word, ozone depletion potential. So, R12 CFC has an ozone depletion potential of one. The second one on the list, R22, or HCFC, has an ozone depletion potential of 0 0.01. So what that means is that from R12 to R22, R22 is 20 times less damaging to the ozone as R12. The highest number is 1, the highest number is R12. HFC refrigerants, such as, and they use this, this as an example, R134A, uh, has zero ODP because it does not have chlorine. It is HFCs, HFCs are hydrogen, fluorine, and carbon. No chlorine, no ODP potential. So those ones like uh, 410A, uh, HFC one uh, HFC one thirty four A no chlorine. The one they'll test you about and ask will be one thirty four A this one. So you don't have to learn all of the refrigerants, just the ones that that you see in your study guide and in the presentation that I gave you that they talk about. So. Here it is to showing you the three primary types of refrigerants that are in use. This is very true. This is generally what we're going to encounter out there. They're either going to be one of these three. They're either going to be CFCs, they're going to be HCFCs, or they're going to be HFCs. These are the names, R11, 12, R500, R22, R123, R134A, R410A, little a, big A, it has to do with the symmetry, a non-symmetry of the compound of the refrigerant, if you recall, from Unit 9. Um, this is where I'll remind you, if they're talking about a low pressure refrigerant, it end in an odd number. If they're talking about a high pressure refrigerant, it end in an even number for the ones that they use for their illustrations. And these are the names, the element names. Remember, the first thing is what's the most, the second most, the least. And in all cases, the least uh, um, element is carbon in all three of them. All this is under the Federal Clean Air Act. 
The EPA regulations for uh, refrigerant handling is actually a very, very small piece of this act. Uh, things that guys always know are two things. What's the cost of the violations per day? Um, at the, uh, when they published this test, it was $27,500 per day per violation. The bounty for turning in your neighbor for releasing refrigerant is up to $10,000. These are, and I'm not going to read these, these are things that are violations of Section 608 of the, of the EPA Clean Air, Clean Air Act. Um, most of the things you see up here, five or six of them, have to do with the mishandling of refrigerant that ends up in them being vented to the atmosphere. And you have this bulleted list that you can go over. We have the federal law that does not permit the state or city from also adding their own laws. So if you go and work in the city of New York, you have to take a city of New York uh, exam for refrigerant handling as well. The rule is that a city can or state cannot add a, a, a rule that's less strict than the federal rule. They can make it more strict, they just can't make it less strict. But your EPA certification will be good anywhere on Long Island, and it will be good in whether you're here or in Wyoming someplace. Montreal Protocol. All this began with an international agreement, international treaty, that we would self-regulate ourselves and reduce or eliminate the production of CFCs, HCFCs, halons, methyl chloroform, and carbon tetrachloride, which was a really great cleaner for um, uh, cleaning out motor windings, if you've ever been around anywhere where they use that. They did an excellent jobs. Uh, one of the first dates that you have pop up here, CFCs were phased out of production on December 31st, 1995. Dates. There's about it's about eight dates, maybe eight to twelve dates that you have to remember. If you go to the test site I put together, epatestprep.com, I have one test bank of questions that's just dates. It's only twelve questions. You take it, you print it out, and then you'll have all the dates, and you can just use it to study from there. <coughs> Recovery. We're going to talk about recovery, recycle, and reclaim. Recovery <coughs> means, for the definition for the EPA exam, to remove refrigerant, refrigerant in any condition from an appliance and store it in an external container. Recovery and reuse. If we recover refrigerant, and remember we're strictly just taking it from that machine we're working on, that appliance, and storing it in an external container, I can give it back to the customer, to that customer. I can't give it to sell it to anyone else, but I, I can reuse it for that customer, even if I replace the condenser, the compressor, or another major component as long as I know that the refrigerant is okay. Only for that customer, and the idea behind this is to eliminate cross-contamination. However, what if I were to put on my recovery machine a filter dryer in the, in the hose inlet and just screw it right in? They have quarter-inch fittings, right? Uh, if I were to do that, then I'm no longer just recovering refrigerant. I am, by definition of the law, now recycling the refrigerants because I added a filter dryer and what I did with the filter dryer is I removed some moisture and I removed some particulates, some solid matter that the filter dryer would collect. So because I did that, and if I did it more than once, that it would really be uh, good, but because I did it just one time, i am now gone from I've recovered to I've recycled. That is the definition of recycling. Reclaim, on the other hand, is where you can take 
the refrigerant to a factory and they will bring it back to what's called its sometimes its virgin state and to where it's factory fresh, where it's all the way cleaned up. And they do this to a particular standard. The standard number is the one they're going to test you on. It's ARI 700. So it's one of those numbers you're going to have to remember. ARI 700. So it, it is tested to make sure it meets that standard and then it can be resold. And that is reclaiming. Now, recovery devices. These get people confused because the words mean different things from what we want. People are confused between system dependent and self-contained. So the first thing up is a date to remember. Recovery devices, refrigerant recovery and or recycling equipment manufactured after November 15, 93 must be certified and labeled by an EPA approved equipment testing organization to meet EPA standards. For example, EPA um, approval agency would be UL, Underwriters Lab. All of you are very familiar with seeing on every tool, every appliance, it says UL rated okay. Well, Underwriters Lab also rates and says that the machine is an approved refrigerant recovery machine. So here's what confuses people. System dependent and self-contained. So listen to how I say this. We're talking now about recovery machines. Uh, one is going to be, one's going to deal with the machine, the other is going to deal with no machine. So the first one, system dependent, captures, removes refrigerant with the assistance of the components in the appliance from which the refrigerant is being recovered. In English, it means here, it's what you hear people when they say pump down. We're working on this refrigerator and it has a leak in its evaporator. We are going to remove the refrigerant using the refrigerator's compressor to pump the refrigerant out, to, to get the refrigerant out. That would be system dependent. I'm dependent on the system, on the appliance I'm working on. If it's number two, self-contained, it means that it has its own means to draw the refrigerant out of the appliance. That is, it's the yellow and black machine we have. It's a recovery machine. It has its own compressor. It doesn't care if the compressor could be missing from that appliance. It could be broken. It could not run. It doesn't need it. The yellow and black machine that you've used here, that you've seen used here, has its own compressor. So number two is where you're bringing your own recovery machine Number one is where you're using the compressor of the machine you're working on. So try, I think if you think of the pump down with number one, that may help you with this, because it can get a little confusing, especially when we go to active and passive. So, sales restriction. Here we got another date, November 14th. This is why you're in this room now, because since that date, this 1994, the sale of a class one or class two CFC and HCFC refrigerants were restricted only to you guys who are certified for this work. So as of that date was when they started requiring people to take the EPA certification exam. And when I took it, which was actually not long after that date right there, um, and you asked about do you have to draw out the cycle? Guess what? There wasn't any. There was no multiple choice questions. You just had to draw out the cycle and, and just write a, uh, a page about this stuff. That was the exam. Uh, so, as of that date, sale was restricted. And then, just be aware that technicians that are certified in 609 are the ones who are allowed to work on and recover the vehicle air. Now, refrigerants and their substitutes and oils. Uh, 
HFC refrigerants, they have no chlorine. They're considered environmentally friendly. Uh, <coughs> R134 is the leading candidate that's used for R12 retrofit, CFC R12 retrofit. They just want to point out it's not a drop-in substitute. That's a test question. Uh, there is no drop-in alternatives, but 134A can be used in most R12 systems by following the appropriate retrofit procedures. They're not going to get into the whole range of what would be the retrofit procedures. For example, removal of the filter dryer is a retrofit procedure. Um, we're changing out the compressor most likely, or if it's a larger system, we're certainly changing the oil, another one. Flushing the system with either nitrogen or another heavy flush to get the oils out of the line set is part of that procedure. The problem is, is that the oils with a CFC, an HCFC refrigerant, doesn't work well with the HFC refrigerants. Uh, most CFC and HCFC refrigerants were an alkaline benzene oil based oil and the uh, HFCs were more um, man-made. They were polyesters or ester based oils. So the oils don't really like each other. You got to swap them out. Refrigerant blends. Now today we have blended refrigerants, R410A, a blended refrigerant. And, and you know that blended refrigerants are supposed to be charged as a liquid, not as a vapor, because uh, refrigerant blends, and these blends are normally three refrigerants put together, ternary, that means they're a three-part blend. Uh, they also use a synthetic alkaline benzene oil, a synthetic one. The reason being is that these, these uh, refrigerants are going to have, um, some of them are going to have R22 as part of their makeup. So refrigerant blends, because a blended refrigerant will leak from a system at uneven rates due to different vapor pressure, the proper me method of charging them is as a liquid <coughs> and also to way into the high side of the system as a liquid. That last part, the way in the high side of the system as a liquid, is one of the test bank questions that always appears. So keep that in mind. Temperature glide. We're now referring to... Oh, I'm sorry. It's all right. 11 o'clock? Yep. Okay. Yep, I'll be uh, leaving in 10 minutes. Okay. Um, Mr. Rupp, that sheet wants, I'm very sorry, guys. That sheet wants. Yeah. Ten more minutes, that's it. Hmm? Ten more minutes, that's it. Sure, that's it. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Sorry, yeah. Bob. Uh, so I have to go up to this thing in about ten minutes. So what you guys can do is you can stay here and study, and they're just going to lock you in. I think you can leave, but you, you're going to lock the doors. So there should be nobody in there. I thought this was supposed to go to 1 o'clock. They have an emergency uh, meeting at 11. I'm going to be back after it's over and done with. So I'll be back. Uh, they, they say it should be short. Uh, temperature glide. Temperature glide refers to refrigerant blends that has a range of boiling points and or dew points, condensing points, throughout the evaporator and condenser, respectively. What they're getting into here is that they want to make sure a couple of things. One, you're going to be asked to read a pressure temperature chart. In the uh, uh, handout that is the study guide, the very last page is a PT chart that you'll be asked to bring with you to the exam because you're going to be asked questions from that. What they want to point out is that some refrigerants that are blends, ternary blends, are going to have this temperature glide. That means they don't work with the PT chart. And these are going to be what's going to be called, not azeotropic, the one that's up here, but the zeotropic refrigerants.
this. <coughs> so if you have a blended refrigerant, and it's said to be azeotropic, the word is up here, it means that it's going to act the way it should act. And it's, you're going to be able to look it up on a pressure temperature guide. If you have a refrigerant that belongs to the classification of not azeotropic, but zeotropic, then it's going to have a range of, you're not going to be able to use a PT chart to figure out what's going on, in other words. Uh, that's the point they're trying to make. They don't really go further into it than that for the test. So if it's azeotropic, you can use a PT guide. If it's zeotropic, you, it doesn't apply. Now another word, hydroscopic oil. Most words, most refrigerant oils are hydroscopic, meaning is one that easily absorbs and releases moisture and that it likes water a lot. Instead of it being an oil that doesn't work well with water, which are some oils, most oils that you encounter, these are the other way around. They have what's called, they use here's an affinity. An oil sample should be taken and analyzed if a system has had a major component failure. The last two lines there, it appears in type 1, <coughs> type 2, and type 3. There's only, there's a hundred questions. There's only so many questions you can ask a guy about refrigeration handling. So you're going to see several questions repeat for 1, for 2, for 3. Which is good if you know the answer, because that gives you 1, 2, 3 in your, te in your back pocket not so good if you don't know the answer. This is one that shows up. Major component failure. You need to take a um, oil sample. The other part of this question that shows up in 1, 2, and 3 is what is a major component failure? And a major component failure, according to the definition by the EPA, is any time that you have a compressor, a, condens uh, a condenser, metering device, Auxiliary heat exchanger fail. Any of the big components. This is the duty bound slide. This slide here says that you are duty bound to inform your customers that you must, if you're doing this work, that you're going to have to recover the refrigerant, make the repair, test with nut dry nitrogen, then evacuate the system, dehydrate the system and then charge the system, and it's going to cost them three times as much as it would have 25 years ago, or 20 years ago. Because you're duty bound to tell them that you have to follow the procedure all the way, with no shortcuts. And any other reputable company, technician, will do the same. EPA requirements of equipment manufacturers. EPA regulations require service, aperture, or process stub on all appliances that use a class 1 or class 2 refrigerant in order to make it easier to recover refrigerant. Type 1 equipments, 5 pounds or less, refrigerators, window package air conditioner units, dehumidifiers. If you look at the base where the compressor is, the hermetic compressor, you'll see there'll be one piece of copper tubing that's dead-ended, that's the process stuff. That's where you're going to put a piercing type valve in order to remove the refrigerant. They're required by law to put that there. And remember, class one refrigerant is CFC, class two is HCFC. When you recover refrigerants, you cannot mix the refrigerants in the recovery cylinder, like I happening around here, although I was assured that it wasn't happening. Uh, when you mix the refrigerants, you're pretty much done with that tank. You can't do anything with it, but when you take it to APCO to turn it in for an exchange to get an empty tank, is you're going to have to just pay them to burn it off. So if you turn into them a can that has all the same refrigerants, then you'll be able to get store credit for that refrigerant if they can re 
claim it back to brand new. So you get an empty can and you get store credit for a new refrigerant, which is a good thing for you and your costs. Uh, if they discover that a uh, tank is contaminated, then you're going to have to pay the fee for the uh, destroying the uh, refrigerant. How about the tank itself? is? If rusted, just like a propane tank, if the tank itself is rusted and messed up, you're, gonna, you're not going to get an exchange, you're going to have to end up buying a tank. You know, it's, it's, it's no different than turning in propane, doing, going that way, exchanging propane. Um, and the way that you discover what kind of refrigerants in this is they use the pressure temperature readings. They take the temperature of the liquid refrigerant and they see what is, it, what is this pressure inside that tank. And that's how you know. Like the tank of 134A. When I was using the machine in this room just last week, the thing was coming in at 250 pounds PSI on high side. So I knew there was no way that it was 134A for what we were doing. Refrigerant recovery with a compressor burnout. This is found in 1, 2, 3. They asked this question over and over and over again. Um, and here's the bullets. If you think, if you suspect that it's a burnout, a strong odor is an indication. Flush the system and watch for signs of contamination of oil. If nitrogen is used, flush the debris out of the system. Nitrogen can be vented, and a suction line filter dryer should be installed or replaced um, to trap any debris that may damage the new compressor. This one repeats three times on the, on the test. Easy, whether you're in type 1, type 2, or type 3. I will be back. Uh, Got to go up there. Now do you see the, uh, you have this?